Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you, everybody who is online joining us virtually. I um, wanted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Robert Warren. He was my master's thesis advisor at Buff State. And one of the big influences my career had. <laughs> um, I think something we were talking about last night at dinner and this morning actually is just this idea of staying curious. And I think Robert's really shown that in his career. Robert actually started out as a newspaper journalist and that really influenced my decision to work with him because when I was looking for a, an advisor, I was trying to read all these scientific papers. I didn't really have much background in science. I just knew that I needed to find someone I could work well with and I was interested in their work. And his set was really the first that I came across that I went, wow, these are really well written and interesting. Um, so that made me want to reach out. And then we started a conversation that led down a really cool path for us. So that has continued. He's authored over 60 papers, one of which was in climate change, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and just this past year, he was promoted to full professor at Buff State. Um, so without further ado, introduce you to Robert Warren. Thank you, Charlene. And uh, thank you all for having me. This has so far been great. I haven't even got the questions yet, but um, amazing facility and grounds. And um, for years, I've seen the Cary Institute, and it's really fun to actually put a place with that name. So again, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, today, we're going to talk about oak leaf galls and Miramacocra seeds. And I want to start off with doing nothing. It's changing here. <laughs> this this is advancing. Yep, it's working here. There we go. Technology. Uh, all right. So um, we'll kind of finish with this research that was recently published, and I wanted to make sure to credit all who were involved before I talk too much me, me, me. Um, this was a collaboration between myself and um, Andy Deans and John Tucker at Penn State, as well as um, one of my graduate students and their postdoc. And I'll get more into that. But this uh, just came out and it's been it's been a lot of fun. And so 20 years ago, we'll go back to the to the wayback machine. Um, I started at the University of Georgia, and I was interested in how uh, the physiology of evergreen plants affected their distribution. And when I joined the Pulliam lab, they had already set up these huge demography plots with you know 10,000 individuals of these different species. So I picked the two evergreens to work on my project. Now these two evergreens have been picked not because they were evergreen, but by a uh, grad student that preceded me picked them because they're both ant dispersed. So kind of an odd overlap. Um, before, yeah, before I get that. So I had set up field plots. Um, you could see water barrels. You know, I was young and dumb enough to set up remote irrigation in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. I'd put big tanks on my truck and water pumps and bears would come out and chew up the water lines. But I was very focused on the abiotic environment that might be driving the distribution of these species. Um, 
I could never actually explain why um, hepatica, which is a cosmopolitan species, was disappearing in Georgia, whereas hexastylus, which is a southeastern endemic, was thriving. None of, of my research explained that phenomenon. And one day I was loading up my light wand and all my equipment, and it just thought, what if it's the ants? What if this is actually controlled by the ants that disperse them and not necessarily the plants? And so that Pandora's box. So I start going down this road of Miramacocri, um, realizing that uh, a large majority of the spring plants, particularly spring flowering plants, are ant dispersed. And so if you want to go on a really irritating hike, join me in the spring and my wife will attest, oh, that's ant dispersed, that's ant dispersed, oh, that's ant dispersed. She's, I know, hon, I know. Because <laughs> almost everything in the spring is ant dispersed. And that's pretty much to capture the window of when an ant will pick up a seed, which is only in early spring. In the Northeast, in the mid um, Atlantic, and most of the South, if you are in, in a deciduous forest, it's um, a phenogaster or a phenogaster rudis complex that is going to be doing all of the seed dispersal. Um, it doesn't get as much good publicity as like a carpenter ant because it doesn't go into homes. But if you took all of the ants in Eastern forests and put them on this side of the scale and only a phenogaster on this side of the scale, you'd have more biomass and numbers of a phenogaster. They are exceedingly dominant in Eastern deciduous forests. So uh, not surprisingly, the plants have hijacked their foraging for, for dispersal. Now, phenogaster is also pretty important. If, if you pump the stomachs of your woodland salamanders or toads or frogs, you're gonna find a phenogaster. It's, it's a main prey item for um, the next level of food chain. They don't particularly like them. You know, they're bitter but there's so many, they move, they get predated upon. They also, if you, as you move south, they're very influential on termites. Termites are their favorite food, and you can see a pronounced effect on decomp if you have a phenogaster because they knock back the termites. So they actually slow decomp. They'll also sometimes harvest uh, fungal hyphae out of their nests so they can slow down uh, fungal decomp. So they have a huge influence on the forest. Um, beyond uh, dispersing the seeds. So when I started down this avenue, at some point, I don't know actually at what point, but I started thinking, what if there's this asynchrony between when these plants are dropping their seeds and when the ants are actually out foraging? And what I found is down in Georgia, um, you have a Phenogaster rudis, which we might call the warm species or the cold intolerant species of this genre. You find them more towards coastal areas and low elevations. Picea, you find uh, high elevations. They will be what's here, uh, certainly what we find in Buffalo. And so as it turns out in Georgia, rudis will not come out until June. And by that time, hepatica has dropped their seeds and the seeds have rotted. Hexastylus, who releases its seeds in July, is fine, totally in conjunction. Um, Picea, which you don't find until you start to hit the southern Appalachian escarpment, comes out in, I mean, you will see those maybe even as late March. So it overlaps with hepatica dropping its seed as well as hexastylus. So if you look, at plots in um, Georgia, where you have this hepatica, the only place you find seedlings are downslope. So if the plant's here, this is upslope, this is downslope, gravity and water is the only thing dispersing those seeds. Whereas if you look at hexastylus, the ants are carrying them away. So this, and, and this is just a projection, uh, this is probably a post-glacial retreat. Everybody was in the southeast at the glacial maximum. Picea migrated back up. These plants are trapped 
with the warm ants. So this is a, a probably a glacial carryover, also a, a portend of things to come with warming. And you see this exact same pattern in southeastern trilliums. A lot of your endemic disappearing trilliums are in the southeast and probably the very uh, exact same phenomena. The ants that disperse them have moved north. And so nobody's dispersing them. So there's no uh, potential for metapopulation dynamics. When a population blinks out, it's gone. And so they're slowly disappearing at the south end of their range. Okay, so I'm describing a um, North American phenomenon, but Miramacocri is worldwide. In fact, North America is not where it's most prevalent. Uh, current count, approximately 11,000 plant species um, use ants um, for dispersal. Essentially, they have in some form this appendage on the seed called an eliasome. The eliasome is a collection of, of fatty acids, uh, lipids that the ants are attracted to. In general, the ants remove the eliasome, feed it to the larva, and discard the seed um, as trash. Most beneficially, if they discard it inside the nest in a, sort of a trash chamber, but they sometimes do kick them out of the nest. Um, it's not known what's the, the dynamic. Why this occurs? Um, I think it's debatable. <laughs> as do some other scientists. Um, for plants, certainly alleviation of density dependent uh, uh, effects. So getting the kids away from the parents is always good. That's probably for sure a benefit. Um, the ability to colonize new habitat, although the ants do not move these very far. This is, there, there's, there's no long distance dispersal with an ant. And so, I think there's still room for potential other mechanisms for long distance dispersal that are undiscovered, potentially um, deer or something like that. Certainly some gene flow, but that's going to be much more through pollen exchange than um, seed dispersal. In dry habitats, such as in Africa and Australia and some places in South America, the clear benefit is that seeds underground do not burn up in fire. And so in other places, Miramacocri is much more prevalent in dry habitats, particularly again, Australia and Africa. Um, at the same time, these are uh, in dry habitats, you're gonna have more moisture. Even here, a phenogaster is completely desiccation intolerant. So they're only gonna nest in moist logs, which is also a really good place for seeds. At the same time, this is a really good place for pathogens. And so um, as Charlene looked at in the lab, um, pathogen protection might be the big ad uh, advantage of this interaction. Ants being somewhat clonal, living in dark, wet places, they excrete constantly through metapleural glands on their sides and their jaws, they're constantly excreting antimicrobial compounds. And as Charlene found, some of these also kill plant uh, pathogens. So the, the, the full benefit here may be this fungal protection. And I bring all of this up because we're gonna come back around to this with galls. Okay. So this, I would guess everybody in the audience has heard of seed dispersal by ants, Miramacocri on some level. Um, it doesn't, it's not the only such interaction. So uh, kind of very underlooked until recently is Vespicori or seed dispersal by wasps. Of course, Hymenoptera, ants and wasps are pretty closely related. I will note though, uh, you know, 11,000 ant dispersed plants at current count, what about six <laughs> wasp dispersed plants? Again, this is pretty new, so it's possible there's more. I have never seen a wasp pick up a, si a, a, a seed in the Eastern US. This seems to occur more in the West. Um, this one I find particularly 
fascinating. This is Callicanthus occidentalis. Does anybody, does Callicanthus floridus occur in Cary by any chance? Certainly it's all over the Southeast. It's a, um, it's a beautiful shrub. It's got a very aromatic smell. In the Southeast, that pod hangs down like this and rodents come and chew holes and take the seeds out. On the other side of the Mississippi, Occidentalis holds the pod open like this and it opens up with a hole and the wasps go in and pull the seeds out. So fascinating difference, at least to me. Um, there's a couple species on the Pacific Northwest that are clearly uh, wasp dispersed. Uh, Steminoma, these, these four here, which are Southeast Asia, there's actually great video footage of the wasps. So, there's only one study that's looked at the essentially the eliasome on wasps dispersed seeds. It has the same chemical composition as on the ant dispersed. So we're seeing a very, very similar convergent pattern here on this attractant for insect dispersers. Um, I think I previewed my slide. Here's just some examples again of, of wasps. Uh, interacting with these seeds. What I've noticed is, in general, the wasp dispersed uh, seeds are held off the ground, where almost always the ant dispersed are down on the ground, and that might guide future investigation into this phenomenon. Secondly, uh, walking sticks or phasmids, they have, they drop their eggs from the trees, and in many, many species, their eggs have these appendages that very much resemble an eliasome, and they elicit the same response. The ants use that as a, as a handle. It's also an attractant. They take back um, this egg to their nest. It hatches in the spring, and the little baby walking sticks walk out of the nest. The ants won't bother them. So there's some adaptation that they can get the ants to leave them alone. This is not rare. Um, I think E.O. Wilson estimated there's about 11,000 species that take advantage of ants. So ants, incredibly successful design, lots of extra energy, apparently enough to spare. Why would they do this? Again, uh, potentially for a walking stick, they're gonna, they're gonna cover more distance during herbivory than an ant's going to disperse their seeds. So distance doesn't make a lot of sense for this one. Um, again, probably safe site, a place that parasitoids can't get to their eggs, possibly again, uh, fungal and bacterial protection. Very, very under investigated here. So beyond that, there's not much known. Um, and I will say when I first found galls in ant nests, I thought they were phasmid eggs, which is why I initially went to an entomologist to help me ID them. Um, ooh, that was a perfect segue. So let's talk about gall dispersal. Um, and I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with galls, but if anyone's watching or not, uh, you know, essentially a cancer-like growth or tumor initiated by insects injecting chemicals into a plant the plant reacts by growing. Uh, it works that they grow around the eggs of the, the insect that deposit them. And I think I have a nice little yeah, aphids, gall flies, or diptera, midges, mites, and wasps all do this. Um, we see such a, a, a mix of shapes. My favorite's always the apple galls in the spring, um, which is, yeah, I love, we'll get to this with the other galls, is this is essentially a two-stage um, manipulation because one, the insect has manipulated the plant to grow protection, but squirrels will eat the larvae. So they've actually manipulated them into this big shape that, that makes it hard for the squirrel to get to the center to get that larvae. So um, kind of a just astounding level of coevolution to get this tree to work so hard for your larvae. In some galls, the, the plant will actually shunt sugar into the gall to feed the larvae. So these are highly co-evolved interactions. And in fact, 
most galls are named after the insect that induces them because it's it's so highly specialized so it's it's one species of insect on a particular species of plant so you don't you see a big drop off in galls on invasive species because their their hosts are not here and there's just there's not much generalization across that interaction oak galls so about this time of year on uh, many trees you'll see a, a leaf gall that looks something like this uh, these are by, caused by snippid wasps. Um, they also have another form that looks, we call them a wig, wig gall, um, looks like this. These leaf galls, these snippid leaf galls are exceedingly abundant. And that'll be important as we move forward to the point that in the early 1900s, they were used as livestock feed. So there were enough of these to gather up, fill buckets and feed livestock. And there's, we have uh, papers from the early 1900s where they did nutritional analysis on why this was good to feed to your livestock. So um, not a rare phenomenon, although my guess is most of us didn't quite notice that or notice um, the level of that. So actually this is a good place to, in, in 2014, I was doing research at the Coeda LTER, and we were looking at the effects of exurbanization, exurbanization uh, which is essentially people building houses in the country, keeping the trees. And we were looking at, I was looking at how that affected seed dispersal, whether that was a fragmentation of, of the Miramacocris interactions. And so I use these artificial nests. Um, Pine, pine wood that I route up chambers, put some plexiglass on top, ceramic tile. A phenogaster loves them. They're like the Hilton for a phenogaster. So they move in and it's a great way to monitor populations. And so we pulled all those nests and I found the chambers just full. If you take this piece off, just full of these guys. And I, you know, I was like, these are not seeds. Hmm. And so we had an entomologist uh, um, at Buff State, and I took them to him, and I said, are these phasmid eggs? He's like, no, I think these are galls. I dissected them, and sure enough, they were gall wasps. And I thought, well, this is, this is interesting. So, and I put this in the paper, but this wasn't the focus of the paper. It was just an observation. And gosh, 2019, I had a study, a student work, kind of a follow-up of Charlene's looking at fungal effects of ants, and she brought all of these galls in and said, I'm finding these in the aphenogaster nests. What kind of seeds are these? I was like, those are not seeds. I've seen this before. And now Western New York and Western North Carolina, this is not a, a one-off. This is actually a phenomenon. I said, so this was a Friday. And I said, we need to get with an entomologist that knows this stuff so we can ID these and really figure out what's going on. That Monday, I get an, uh, an email from Andy Deans at Penn State, and he said, hey, did you ever follow up on those galls in the ant nests? We're seeing the same thing in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I said, well, Andy, I don't know you, but you need to add impeccable timing to your CV. <laughs> so that started this whole collaboration. They are gall experts. I'm not and to look into this phenomenon. So one of the first things we did was a histology of these galls. And just to confirm, this is a distinct organ on um, the gall, just as an eliasome is on a seed. We then did chemical analysis and found that the chemicals are pretty much the same, the same uh, lipids, fatty acids, um, on the galls and elizomes, which, you know, is worth pausing for a moment. We have herbaceous plants intentionally putting this on their seeds, but now we have oak trees putting these exact same chemical mixes onto these galls as induced by wasps. So, yeah, this is, I mean, we did not expect it would be the same chemicals, I will admit. Um, so that is very fascinating. And so we did lots of experiments in the field. Um, just one here where we would, we took a gall 
that does not have, oh, I'm sorry. And, you know, when you discover something, you get to name it. So we named uh, the gall eliasome capellos, which is Greek for cap, because we were calling them gall caps. And I'm like, we have to have a better name than that. So they're capellos. So we took a gall that has no capello, took a gall um, that has a capello, but we cut them off. Then we left the capello on these. And I'm sorry, then we just did the capello only and the body plus the capello. And what we found is um, the ants showed little interest in the non capello gall or the gall we had cut the capello off. We found no the much greater interest and no difference in galls with a capello or the capello only. So very clearly the capello is what they're attracted to. And we see this when we see the interaction. This is what they all interact with. They sort of ignore the seed body. They're, they're omnivorous ants, but they're not granivorous. They don't eat the seeds. So that's just kind of extra weight for them. And so essentially we see this very, this high level of convergence, almost no difference between how the ants are interacting with the seeds and the galls. Um, they investigate and it's, it's indistinguishable. You know, they come up, they attenuate, they put their mandibles on there and eventually they pick them up. And nine times out of 10, it's by the actual appendage they pick them up, they remove the appendage and they toss out the rest, either the seed or the gall, unharmed, oftentimes still in the nest, just in a trash chamber. And here, live, I don't know how to, there we go, here will be an example. So this is an Aphenogaster Picea. Uh, Sanguinaria canadensis, bloodroot seeds are brown. And then these are uh, cocoa synopsis um, oak galls. You feel yourself rooting. Come on, you can get it. Pick it up. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Quick aside for those that do field work this is like the standard bait station setup. And I'm working with a student down in North Carolina looking at the uh, impact of the Asian needle ant invasion down there. And we use these exact same trays and they they trap all of the Asian needle ants because they have no climbing ability whatsoever. They can't actually get back out. So we had to adjust our design for these awful climbers. So if you ever wonder if you have Asian needle ants, just put them in a plastic cup. And if the ants crawl out, you don't have them. If they're trapped helplessly and endlessly, you have Asian needle ants. <laughs> so uh, this is how the disposal works. I will note, I've done these experiments where I put uh, termites, um, dead termites in here, the ants don't even hesitate. All that investigating you saw, if there's a termite, it's snatch, grab, run. Um, so they do eat, they do pick up these seeds, but they're in no way a, a high level food item for the ants. Okay. And that kind of brings us to what's the driver of this interaction? Um, again, I'm dubious that it's movement, because if you think of the drip line of an oak tree, these galls are going to fall farther, farther apart than ants will carry them uh, by probably an order of magnitude. 
So there's not a lot of movement going on. Um, there's a lot of literature that says these galls are hit very heavy by parasitoids. So we, I think, again, speculate that maybe being down in an ant nest, the parasitoid, parasitoids don't go in. Uh, it also could be uh, uh, scatter hoarding rodents. Um, we see this with the Miramacocra seeds, but we don't see the density of Miramacocra seeds that you do with these galls. So if you're a scatter hoarding rodent, getting under an oak tree with all these galls could be a massively good food item. And we have done some night vision video with the galls and definitely uh, the, the night rodents like them. So we think that might be another benefit is to get away from the rodents. And then finally, these galls are known to be hit very hard by fungal pathogens. So it's a little bit of a stretch, although we found it that you would find that ant protective micro, uh, microbial count compounds protect against plant pathogens, but certainly ants being insects, gall wasps being insects, whatever uh, pathogenic protection the ants have is probably right on target for a wasp larva. So we think that might be a, um, a big benefit um, of this. For the ants, Folks like to call Miramacocri a mutualism. I don't buy it. Um, at best, maybe some supplementary food, possibly commensal. Maybe it's just enough nutrition to offset carrying those and not getting other foods. Um, possibly even parasitic. The ants just might be getting tricked. And so I've had plant people, not ant people, get very angry when I suggest this. And they're like, food in itself is a benefit. Well, if anybody's familiar with acacia trees and the ants that use acacia trees, once the ant tastes the nectar, it can no longer digest anything but the nectar. It's addicted or death. I don't know that I would call that a mutualism. <laughs> so I think that there's more complex things here than just a simple trade in goods. And the experiments we've done with the seeds, we find no benefit of um, Miramacocra seeds for aphidogaster ants. Uh, again, maybe supplemental. The idea that there's this spring window that they fill in the gap for food, I have never found evidence that that works. By June, well, one thing, and I'll finish here, what you notice is the smallest seeded Miramacocors release their seeds first. And the seeds get larger by species as you move on. Because if you put out, and I've done this, I freeze the seeds, I put out small seeds in July, ants won't touch them. They've got so much food, they're not even gonna bother with this. They will pick up the big ones because there's still something attractive, but um, they lose interest pretty fast in the seeds, unlike things like termites or dead caterpillars or something like that. So there's a lot to figure out in terms of these benefits. What we're kind of doing now conceptually is backtracking. So we, we have this gall interaction that's clearly or pretty clearly not about movement. So we're kind of we're thinking what we can find out about this interaction as benefits might then explain what's going on with the seeds, we hope. Okay, so just to kind of add, this gall thing is not just with uh, what we might call um, The specifically. There are actually galls that mimic extrafloral nectaries. And see, I just did it. Mm. Maybe mimic. Maybe extrafloral nectaries are mimicking the galls. This is, I think, a trick that happens to us. The first thing discovered, we think, is the first thing that happened. Um, so anyway, there are galls that are just like extra floral nectaries. They release sugar, the ants come and eat the sugar, and they fight off anything that tries to hurt the gall. Just like the plants, extra floral nectaries get them to fight off herbivores. Um, so, you know, that's fascinating. This is not published, this is just from our observations. We also see granivorous ants picking up starchy galls. 
So there's a possibility because, you know, if you go to the deserts, for example, you'll find a lot of seed dispersing ants, but they're eating the seeds, dropping a few, forgetting about a few, just kind of like squirrels with acorns. So really scatter hoarding um, ants. And we see those same species of ants interested in these starchy galls that also drop off the trees. So this might be a third parallel interaction. All right. So the big mysteries. Um, I was so hoping when I went to the fossil record, I could find one of these preceding the other. Anybody that does ecology knows it's never that easy and straightforward, but we thought, well, oh, maybe, <laughs> but no. Turns out Merimacocri involving eliosomes and sinipid wasp galls arose about the exact same time. I mean, 20 million years, there's a lot of error in there, but generally the same time. Um, during the Miocene, planets transitioning from a very warm to a, a cooling, more dry um, climate, and possibly that had something to do with it. Um, where it gets kind of confusing in terms of, this is, uh, of the convergence of this, these evolutionary processes, if you look at Miramacocri, um, it is worldwide. Hotbeds are actually South America and Africa. Probably the third would be Australia. These tend to be, these two in particular, very dry habitats, whereas you see it a lot in the Eastern US and Europe, um, deciduous forests, so very different climates. But then when we look at Quercus, which you don't have sinipid wasps without Quercus, very tightly bound, you have a very different, you don't even have them in Australia. Um, their hotbeds are really uh, China and, and Mexico. So in terms of how some sort of overlap led to these, these converged patterns is a mystery. Um, Secondly, a phenogaster is one of the most uh, desiccation intolerant ants you're going to find in eastern deciduous forests. Uh, I, we've done bait stations in, in pure oak forests and not picked up a phenogaster at all, which we would expect to be the highest density of sinipid wasps. So you have, you know, oaks kind of tending towards xeric forests, or at least pure oak stands, a phenogaster and mesic, so maybe this interaction is only working in mixed deciduous forests. Um, we don't know. We have a grant in, to NSF, or we're putting one in, and this is kind of your classic fish in a barrel. You know, whatever we find will be new, <laughs> because there is just absolutely nothing known uh, about this system. So, you know, one thing that I'm very interested in we're considering is a phenogaster might not be the main disperser for these gulls. Maybe carpenter ants. Carpenter ants can definitely handle um, drier conditions. Maybe vespid wasps. Um, and of course, I just toss this in here. People love this story that gastropods will eat Miramacocra seeds. I don't think they're effective dispersers, but... There might be something out there we don't know of. Um, the other kind of odd part is, is all of the Miramacocra seeds come out in spring, but oak galls drop in fall or autumn. And so it doesn't seem like the best time, you know, ants aren't fattening up for the winter. So it's not necessarily the best time for ants. Um, so again, big wide open questions here. Um, hopefully we have a lot of student projects getting students out in the woods to figure this out. Um, and I do want to finish, I don't think I mentioned, you know, Miramacocri was discovered in Europe in 1906. Um, walking sticks and phasmids, that was discovered in the 1940s. This gall interaction is essentially brand new. And so it's really intuitive and tempting to think that the galls are mimicking the seeds because we knew one before. But then you think about how prevalent the galls are versus the seeds. It could go either way, or it could have been both at the same time. And I think that's a real fascinating question if you're a nerd. I don't know that it has any practical um, application, but I, I want to know. So I'm hoping uh, with further research, we could figure that out as well. Um, 
Yeah, I think I hit all that, didn't I? Sometimes I precede my slides, but you know. By the way, this is an aphenogaster carrying an oak gall through a hemlock forest or mixed deciduous with a lot of hemlock. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, I'm going to start inside here um, <laughs> just for my own sake. All right, I'll start with Jane. What's your question? Oh, that's a great question. We do Robert, see. Do you mind uh, repeating the question? I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Um, if if uh, uh, microbial protection is so important, why are they only harvested? The galls only harvested after they fall from the trees. Uh, we do see ants up interacting on the leaves. Um, but that's a great question. <sighs> yeah, there's a lot here <laughs> to investigate. Um, and again, we we sort of targeted mixed deciduous forests because, frankly, that's what I'm familiar with. Um, but sort of the next phase is going to be to explore alternate dispersers in alternate settings with oaks, and maybe we'll find something different. It seems like a cop out, but. <laughs> okay, next question, Sarah. Um, and I have a lot of questions too, but first of all, I was wondering, I mean, these, the ants seem so much smaller than the balls. Like, what's the weight difference? Um, so she was asking, what's the weight difference between the galls and the ants? Um, I would say, I don't know, other than shooting from the hip, about the galls are about seven times the weight of the ants. But as we know from the song and the rubber tree, ants are really strong, right? <laughs> I'm always, yeah, I watch them and I mean, like you all probably, when I played that video, were like, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, this stuff. <laughs> Excellent. So the question is, uh, what else are the ants eating and sort of the shift in ant preference for uh, seeds and, and or Miramacocra seeds and galls? So the, uh, almost worldwide, if not exclusively worldwide, Miramacocra only occurs with omnivorous ants. So granivorous ants destroy the seeds. Again, you get kind of a scatter hoarding effect, but with, with Miramacocra involving eliasomes, it's pretty exclusively omnivorous ants and a few omnivorous ants. So 11,000 plant species, but only about a hundred ant species. So they will do multiple plants and galls. Um, generally, they eat anything. Now, you know, again, this is the, the torture of hiking with me if you're my wife, because as soon as I see a fetogaster on something new, I'm stopped. And I've seen them eating, a lot of times they will eat uh, mushrooms. Uh, I've seen them dragging along live caterpillars and things, small caterpillars. Uh, they like, if a squirrel gets into those apple galls and breaks it open, man, a phenogaster love what's in there. They will, so they will pretty much eat anything. They love termites. Holy cow, if you're, if, like I'm down in Georgia, I break open a log and I spill out termites, they snatch them up and run. There's no investigating. <laughs> So they really, really, really like dead insects. And um, to kind of finish that, when you look at the chemical makeup of eliasomes and capellos, it's pretty much the same as a dead insect, which is, hopefully don't ruin your lunch, pretty much the same as tuna. So typically, would we want to easily bait for ants? I just use tuna that's been in water and you get the seed dispersing ants, love it. So.
I agree. Most of the experiments that have said that eliasomes benefit ants add eliasomes on top of their already getting a diet. So it's 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 not quite accurate because it's it's a supplemental. It's not choice. Uh, when we've done field experiments with choice, we see no effect. And I've put the the seed baits right next to the ant colony opening, and there's pretty much in the other and I'll finish um, down at Kawita, the Kawita LTR, uh, a scientist, she had set up this, uh, I think she wanted to test the vernal dam theory. And so she removed herbaceous plants from these big plots for 13 years. So I swooped in after she was done and find absolutely no difference in a phenogaster colonies, health, demography, it had no effect. They could care less that the Miramacacris plants were gone. <laughs> that was a big long answer. <laughs> okay. We yes. do have a couple of questions online. I'm sorry. I'll get to you next. <laughs> I'm right. not supposed to be pointing. I, I realize I need to. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Clive, uh, we have a question saying, how similar are the fatty acid profiles between seeds and galls? Are they generic? fatty acids are peculiar? How do they compare with the fatty acid profiles of other plant tissues? Oh, um, the fatty acid uh, uh, makeup of um, seed elizomes and um, gall capellos is pretty much identical. I'm not a chemist. I cannot go much further than that. <laughs> um, I think they're pretty standard. Uh, they're not that different that I think what you find in a lot of insect larvae as well. And again, what you find in dead insects for sure. And so that seems to be the attracted is um, these ants, you know, so to a phenogaster literally covers the ground of the forest floor. They are out early. There are so many of them. They are the best foragers in Eastern deciduous forests. So if there's a dead insect, they're gonna find it. And they're, they're programmed to take that back to the nest. So I think it's not too much arm waving to say that plants have hijacked that behavior. And it would be very hard to evolutionarily extinguish it because that robust foraging is their success. So anything that would select against robust foraging to maybe get them to not pick up the seeds would also select against them picking up all the... So I think that it's just not... You know, it's commensal, slightly parasitic um, at this point. And again, what, 11,000 things take advantage of ants. It's an incredibly successful design with a lot of excess energy. So I think there's a lot of room for hijacking. I sort of dodged some of the chemistry because I don't know. <laughs> okay, Evan? <laughs> Very different. Yeah. So essentially it's starch. And I mean, until you get to the middle of the gall where you have a, a, an insect larvae, so protein. Um, I think that if it was easy to access, the ants would love the protein, but they're, they're either not detecting it or it's just too hard to get into there. Um, especially when the capella is right there. Yeah. Yeah, good. Is there any possible use for creating a 
Yeah, okay. So the question is, what's the uh, advantage for the tree in, in producing uh, not, not only a gall, but an appendage that attracts ants? I would say none. I, I would um, argue that the galls are, are purely parasitic on a tree that this, um, you know, oaks have been around, they're probably our oldest lineage. So there's been a long, long time for coevolution. And I would say that the capello is an extended phenotype of the wasp. And really, again, just a, a parasitic drain on the tree. But again, it doesn't co cost the oaks. I've been hearing Matt Candeus, who runs in defense of plants that I were talking about this the other day, we keep hearing that sinipid wasps are gonna increase with climate change and that threatens the oaks. I, personally, and in, in, in literature, I've never seen that these galls, even in their great abundance, cost the oaks that much. The oaks, you never see a decline in performance or if it is, it's slight. So I think just like the ants are getting manipulated to disperse these seeds, against possibly against their own best interest. I think without a doubt, the oaks are getting manipulated to do this. Same with sort of the extra floral nectary mimics. You know, when these other galls put out the sugar to attract ants to protect them against parasitoids, the oaks get no benefit from that. It simply benefits the gall, which benefits the wasp. Especially when in a system where there's predator association, and there's a huge advantage to being a massive acorn crop to get a few administration seed predators. So I, I, I would wonder whether there is a disadvantage of producing that on the basis of the physiology of the tree and of the question of what counterbalances that seasonality. Sure. Uh, so the, the question was that you question that there's no cost to the oaks. I, maybe I misspoke. I'm at no population level. Um, there's, there's no demonstrable population level cost to galls. Certainly, I would say on an individual level, there's a cost because, yeah. Um, and, you know, my, my guess would be it's much like um, the squirrel acorn interaction that there's population and there's going to be and we see this some years you go out into an oak stand and there's galls everywhere. And some years, like, you know, for the first five years that I was at Buff State, we have a lot of oaks and I'm like, we have no galls, I guess, because we're an urban campus. And then last year they were everywhere. <laughs> and so there might be those sort of uh, uh, oscillations so that in the long run, population wise, it's not, it's not knocking back the oak trees, but in any, any individual year or in any individual oak, certainly cost. Yeah, great questions. Make me think, dance. Um, <laughs> we have a... Go ahead, yeah. Great question. Uh, the question, I'm, I keep forgetting, I'm supposed to repeat. The question is, is the oscillation in, in, in gall abundance due to wasp population dynamics or tree resistance? If I were to guess, I, and the, there's such a high parasite load on the galls that I, I would guess you kind of have a fox and hare thing going on there. But I think oaks clearly produce a lot of anti-herbivory chemicals so that, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, again, as you start getting into ecology, since it's like, really, I have to take this class? Nothing's clear. I'm yeah, going to sure. be really mean and jump in and ask my own question. I'm sorry, everyone online. I will get to your questions, I swear. But because, <laughs> yes, it's another follow-up question. I'm just so curious and wonder, have you thought about maybe it's just the, um, the idea that these galls and these seeds are produced and they're both produced by the plant essentially but it's induced by these parasitoid wasps or I don't know if I'm using that correctly but by the gall inducing insects 
so it's really fascinating because does it make you think maybe there's just there's this genetic makeup hidden in the plant tissue that is being induced like just genetic gene expression being induced by these gall insects and it's something that maybe all plants have similar to how all of us have um a genetic makeup to uh, fight laughing disease that we see in New Zealand. It's just, you know, sometimes you have these underlying relationships that don't really see. Do you think maybe, oh, I was just so curious on a genetic perspective, like maybe it's just written in there and then is it being brought out by these two different systems? Well, and I think that's a good question. So um, is there an underlying, underlying uh, genetic makeup that's being brought out by the wasps? Um, you're certainly not seeing any chemicals that the plants don't produce otherwise, right? So, and again, we've only seen this gall phenomenon with capellos on oaks. And that could be that the oaks have a specific genetic makeup, but also oaks have been around the longest. So, you know, I, sometimes I sit back and go, the wasp tricks the tree into tricking the ant. <laughs> Whoa, right? <laughs> and so this I mean, it simply could be that it's had time for this complex coevolutionary selection to occur where with younger lineages that hasn't happened. And certainly maybe I should mention, um, I think most folks are familiar with Ptolemy's work showing that uh, different, particularly native tree species host greater abundances of native Lepidoptera. And number one on that list for hosting the most Lepidoptera species are oaks. Well, if you do that with gall species, it's an order of magnitude greater than the next one. I mean, you have species that manipulate oaks here and all other gall species here. And it's about, I mean, it's oaks have 900 and some gall gallers that manipulate them. So, that could go to your theory that they have some special. Um, I was just wonder if there was a distant common ancestor that had something and then all plant species have it to some extent, or at least these really old lineages. That is really interesting. Yeah. It is. And again, gall species tend to be very specific to hosts. So, you know, if it, we actually did a study where we show if you look at non native stuff, there's almost no gallers. And, and you get that with Lepidoptera too, but it's very striking with, oak, uh, with um, galls. Okay, I have two online questions that have been very patient. Um, first one is, in Miramacocri involving seeds or galls, are the relationships always mutualistic? Yeah, um, well, and I, I would question mutualistic. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, maybe, well, yeah, I mean, it's such a great question. I, you know, I kind of agree with Judith Bronstein that all mutualisms were once parasitisms. <laughs> And that might become parasitisms again, and parasitisms might become mutualisms. That there's this, you know, there's certainly no altruism involved. <laughs> and so, if if the it, and actually, we, yeah, oh great, okay. So let me go to this. If you look at something like hepatica, hepatica has almost no eliasome, and so you do get uh, plants that fully trick the ants. They have no nutrition whatsoever. They just have a chemical signal. And then you get all the way to things like hexastylus released in midsummer when food is abundant, who has huge eliasomes. And if you take those and put them in the same tray, the ants will make a selection for the bigger eliasome um, across the board. So there is this sort of, you know, what can I get the, the most for the least? So, yeah, I, most ant people will do not call it a mutualism. I think the plant community is starting to catch on. And sometimes it's, it's described as a um, facultative. So plants need the ants, but there's no evidence whatsoever that the ants need the plants. You see a fetogaster where there's no miramacocors for sure. Long answer, I hope. I love this caller's waiting on the line. I'm expecting now a question about the questions. bills, right? <laughs> well, the bills take the Super Bowl. Huh? Secondary's banged up, but okay. <laughs> what species oak produce galls that a phenogaster collects? Mm. Um, 
What a simple question. Um, what have we been collecting from? Pin oaks, bur oaks? I would say probably all. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, anybody familiar with oaks knows they are so promiscuous that where one starts and the other ends can be a little confusing, but <laughs> they hybridize so often. I do see there's one final uh, follow up from Clive again. Uh, but having ants foraging around the canopy likely benefits plants if they consume herbivores, even if they're being attracted to the galls. True. Although a fetogaster is not a big active hunter of live things. Um, they're not a nectary tender. I can use that verb. They do not tend extra floral nectaries like something like Miramica do. Um, they will eat small, soft bodied things that are alive. I mean, that's a great study. See, yeah. I mean, I think all of these are just excellent potential field studies because there's so little known um, about these systems. Believe it or not, there's tons and tons and tons on what the plant benefits are from their seeds being dispersed. And that's still relatively murky. There's maybe less than a dozen studies looking into ant benefits. And then certainly nothing I know that looks into potential secondary benefits. So yeah, if anybody's looking for a thesis or dissertation, take one of these and run and just let me know what you get. <laughs> okay, we're a little past our time, I think. Um, any more really urgent questions that have to we can't wait. We are going to have lunch, uh, so anyone's free to join. And then uh, we have a meeting schedule set up. I think we're ready to go on that. But there will also be a happy hour starting at four. If anyone would like to join for the greater Curie community, certainly feel free to come and talk to Robert. He'll be around all day. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for a great talk. And thank you, everyone, for joining us both here and online. This has been really exciting. Thank you so much. And may I say thank you for Great questions. What a blast. Yeah.